Anybody here into movies? Yeah, I, I, I like movies. Um, I've noticed most movies seem to have um, a, a recurring theme, at least ones with, with action and suspense in them, right? Where there's, there's kind of this dramatic build and you're getting to know the characters and, and then it's um, uh, developing the storyline. And, and then there's like the action sequence, right? Whether it's the fight or the conflict or the war or even in chick flicks, it's, it's, uh, it's the scene where, you know, she finds out that M Matthew McConaughey placed a bet and that's why he was going out with her, right? You know what I'm saying? So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm showing my age a little bit there. Thanks. Um, so, <laughs> but but there's there's the action sequence before things kind of resolve, calm down, and and then you have um, the credits. Um, we're in Acts 27, and Acts has 28 chapters, and we're living out the 29th, right? So so we're we're really close to the end, and and the story has been developing, and what we have in Acts 27 is really an action sequence. Um, and we'll be, we'll be going into, into what that looks like for a little bit. Um, but right before we got to Acts 27, we saw last week in Acts 26 that, that um, the, the trial of Paul was concluded when King Agrippa had enough after Paul had been giving him the gospel, telling him how, how Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophets. And he's going, you believe the prophets, right, Agrippa? You, you, you believe the prophets, right? And he's like, you know what, I'm not answering this. I've had enough. Paul, are you going to convince me to be a Christian in just one short little dialogue? And, um, and we see he's done. He walks away and he says to, uh, King Agrippa says to Festus, this guy could have been let go if he didn't appeal to Caesar, um, whatever, let's go. And we find ourselves entering Acts 27 where there is this little undisclosed period of time um, between here. And uh, we pick up in, in verse one. It says, and when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in a ship of Adramidium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. Say that ten times fast. <clears throat> the next day, we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and to be cared for. A, a few notable things that we see here in, in, in this first passage. First of all, um, the word we is being used. So Luke, um, as, as a doctor and historian putting something together for Theophilus, um, we see when he wrote the Gospel of Luke, had done all these interviews, and even for a lot of Acts, he had done many interviews to come up with his information. But what we'll see in Acts 27 is, this is a first-person view. Luke was here. Luke was on the ship. Luke witnessed this whole thing. And a little later on, we're going to see Luke admits his humanity um, to, to all the readers here. Um, so we see that Luke and Aristarchus are accompanying Paul on his journey to Rome. We also see that the centurion, along with his century, which would have ranged from 80 to 100 men, were acting as a prisoner transportation unit. Essentially, they were Rome's U.S. Marshals, right? Um, they would have been allowed by Rome to commandeer any Roman trade vessel to use for government purposes. So what we see here is he has commandeered a cargo ship. Um, this is a cargo ship that, that they were going to be embarking on that was going to be going along the coast of Asia. And there were likely no prison cells on a cargo ship. Um, so the guards had to stay watch to keep all of the prisoners um, that, that they were watching very carefully. So what do we take from that? We, we see Paul had earned the trust of the centurion named Julius. He earned his trust. So much so, and it's, it's not recorded how or why, but we know that Julius trusted Paul because Julius allowed Paul to go about freely when they were inside him. Go get help from your friends, go get taken care of, you know, just, you know, when we're leaving, come back to, to a prisoner. Now, <laughs> um, not only would that not happen today, um, but today a U.S. Marshal might lose his job um, or worst case scenario, go to prison. Um, this was instant execution for, for these Roman guards. So to have such a level of trust that he would allow a prisoner to go about freely, 
um, was, was pretty impressive. So what, what do we see here from this first little bit? We see Paul was a man who had incredible loyalty and trust from friends and strangers. From friends and strangers. Luke and Aristarchus got on this ship. God didn't call them to go to Rome. God called Paul to go to Rome. And here they were journeying with him. Um, a man who, who they loved, adored, and, and respected, and therefore followed to Rome. We pick up in verse 4. It says, And putting out to sea, from there we sailed under the lee of Cyprus, because the winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Nidus. And as the wind did not allow us to go farther, we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salmon, coasting along it with difficulty again. We came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lacia. Now, this whole thing can be like, okay, so what? It's really confusing without a map, right? So you're welcome. We have a map. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> so we, we see over here on the right is uh, Caesarea. Um, uh, Pastor Tom wanted me to use a laser pointer, but I'm a stubborn Sicilian. So, um, <laughs> so we see Caesarea um, is right over here on the coast. And typically, if you see the purple line and that yellow line, what typically would happen, because these are Paul's other journeys, um, they would have gone straight to, um, to the mainland over there by Nidus, and then they could have gone straight from there through here in the Mediterranean to get to Rome. The thing is, um, they didn't have motor boats, they had sailboats, and the winds made this a very difficult trip. Um, this was typically a nine day trip, and it turned into a few weeks. Um, so it, it, was, it was very complex. So they, they finally, after going on this very difficult route, find their way to Myra. Can you see Myra right there? Yeah, okay, cool. So when they're at Myra, what happens at Myra is they switch ships. They switched to an Alexandrian uh, grain ship, which was um, from Egypt. Okay, and, and there's a couple of reasons why they would do that. First of all, um, the ship that they were originally on was doing trade in Asia. It wasn't going to Rome, so it was going to bow face and, and turn back. Um, also, they probably needed a larger ship because, as you'll see, there's not only tons of cargo on the ship, but there were 276 people on this ship. So this wasn't like a little hobby sailboat. Okay, this, this was a massive, massive ship. Um, we see that, that the wind and the currents at this time of the year, which was the fall, um, had caused them great difficulty and created a very slow-moving journey. Now, the journey was brutal, and they were only able to get to this place called Fair Havens. And the reason for that was because Crete, the island of Crete, had curved north at that point to get to this port called Phoenix, which is where they wanted to go to, and the wind just wasn't letting them. All right? So they're at Fair Havens, and they're stuck there, and it's time to make a decision. This journey took way longer than it was supposed to, and now it's the fall. So we pick up in verse 9. It says, Since much time had passed, and the voyage was now dangerous, because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, and not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. Okay. Well, let's analyze this for a second. First, how do we know that, that it's the fall? Well, he mentions it was right after the fast. The fast was for Yom Kippur, the, the Jewish Day of Atonement. So we know it was late in the fall when they were docked at, at Fair Havens. So why does that matter? Why does it matter to, to a bunch of Americans who I would say most of us, if not all of us, have probably never sailed the Mediterranean? Um, well, here's why it's important. There's a fourth century historian named Vegetius who records sailing in the Mediterranean after September 15th was dangerous 
and after November 11th was impossible. So we know that they set sail um, sometime between September the 15th but before November 11th because no sailor would risk it after November 11th. So they, they were knowledgeable. They were sailors on this boat. They understood there was much risk, much danger. Right? So we know it was before November because none of them would have even risked it. They wouldn't have taken a vote to decide whether or not we're going to go forward. It would have been too dangerous. But they, they wanted to take the gamble. And also, what about, what about where they were? What was wrong with this place, Fair Havens? Um, Fair Havens was, was exposed to winter winds and therefore docking there for the winter may have cost them the boat and cargo anyway. Um, and also, it was not a very well populated area. So there weren't exactly many options for shelter or uh, entertainment for the entire winter. So Paul speaks up at this point and he advises the centurion, the captain, and the ship owner that risking the trip would, would not be a good idea, that it's too dangerous. But how would Paul know this? I mean, Paul wasn't a sailor. We, we have no history stating that Paul was a professional sailor at any point. I mean, was it, was it God-given discernment? Was it, was it divine intervention? Or, or, or maybe is it, is it possible that Paul had some experience with this before? I mean, here's, here's a non-rhetorical question. We're going to get a little, a little interactive, okay? How many times was Paul shipwrecked in the Bible? Three? I heard once, I heard three. All right. Open up to 2 Corinthians 11.25. Paul says, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. Paul was shipwrecked three times by 57 AD when he wrote 2 Corinthians. This was now 60 AD. Paul is on his way to his fourth shipwreck. Can I just say, if I had been in one shipwreck... Adrift at sea for more than 15 minutes, you wouldn't catch me dead on another boat. I, anybody else? I mean, look, we, we might have some sailors in the room. Those of you who serve in the Navy, thank you. God bless you. I learned more this week about nautical terms and winds and sailing than I ever learned in my life. And my respect level for our naval officers has just gone through the roof, <laughs> okay? Um, and for you hobby sailors, too. I don't know what's wrong with you. Um, <laughs> but, but think about this. I mean, I could almost hear in Paul's voice as he's saying, hey, hey guys, um, I've got this feeling in my gut. I've, I've been here before. <laughs> like the wind swirling, this is all too familiar. Um, I, I don't see this ending well. But the centurion ignores Paul. He isn't willing to make a unilateral decision either. So we see some raw democracy. They take a vote, and the majority decides, let's push forward. So they set sail because there is this temporary favorable wind that gets behind them, and within a few short moments, the wind changes to a tumultuous, violent nor'easter. It sweeps in, and it rocks the boat, and it is not going well. They are being tossed to and fro. This gigantic ship was made of wood. And it was going to be torn apart. How do we know that? Because it says that the sailors, they had taken cords and they had taken everything they had to wrap and reinforce the strength of the boat. They tried to strengthen the integrity of the boat. It also shows they, they pulled in the, um, the lifeboat that would have been tagging along. And they were just holding on for a storm. <clears throat> they threw the cargo overboard in hopes to lighten the ship to try and maneuver it through the storm. They tried everything that sailors are trained to do and there was nothing that was in their control even slightly to get control of this ship. We see Luke writes in verse 20, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Thank you, Luke. Thank you for honestly telling us that it wasn't just their hope that had been abandoned, 
It wasn't just the sailors that were a bunch of chickens. Our, me too, I had abandoned hope. A follower of Jesus in the Bible saying he also had abandoned hope. There was a need for a leader in that moment. At this point in the midst of days of chaos, Paul addresses the ship in verse 21. So since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate that. Point well made. <clears throat> Yet, now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. <laughs> it's incredible. The wording in there is incredible. God has granted you the lives of all these people. You know what that tells me? It tells me the second that the storm hit, Paul hit his knees and was like, God, please. We were stupid. It was stupid. Can you relate? I did something stupid again, Lord. Please, please. God has granted you the lives of everybody on this ship. Oh, but guess what, Paul? Your fourth shipwreck's coming. <laughs> You're not going to regain control of the ship. You have to run into some unknown island. Really? Come on. You only grant me half of my request? Is that fair? Yes. <clears throat> so what was everybody's response to Paul's words? We don't know. We don't see an immediate response. What do we see? We see after two weeks of being tossed at sea, they start approaching land. And at this point, the sailors, um, they, they kind of have this sense that they're approaching land. And so they, they let out to measure the fathoms. And, and what they would find first is that it was, it was 120 feet deep. And then a little while, they checked again and it was 90 feet deep. So they're like, great, we're, we're approaching land. And so what do they do? They throw out four anchors to, to begin to slow the ship down. Now, these sailors were probably very skilled and knowledgeable about what to do in this situation. Interestingly enough, um, shipwrecks were not typically um, situations where nobody would die. And I think the sailors knew that because they try to abandon ship. What they do is after they drop these four anchors from the stern, I Again, learn some nautical terms this week. The front's the bow, the back's the stern. I'm very proud of myself. Um, <laughs> um, so after they lay out these four anchors from the stern, these sailors, they go up to the bow, they go to the front of the ship, and they're pretending that they're laying down more anchors. But what they're really doing is letting the lifeboat down so that they, they can get in it and they can escape and they can leave. And Paul oversees this, and then he goes and finds Julius and is like, whoa, um, if they leave, we're all dead. Right? And that, that, that may not resonate so much today. So let me give you a real-life example. Who's ever been on a plane during some really nasty turbulence? Okay, so, so stay with me for a minute. If you're in that plane during the crazy turbulence, and then the pilot comes out from, from the front, puts a, <laughs> puts a parachute on, <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the situation. Nobody else knows how to, how to sail this thing, especially into a shipwreck. And so Paul says to the centurion, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the rope, they set the lifeboat free with no one in it, and said, we're all in this thing together, guys. So we're, we're two weeks in, we're about to hit land, and the sailors want to get off of the ship. It's still storming, and nobody on this ship has any control over what will happen next. 
it's time to panic. I know people say don't panic until it's time to panic. That's when it's time to panic. But Paul interrupts the chaos. In the midst of the panic, he speaks up in verse 33. As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, today's the 14th day you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength, for not a hair is the perish from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread, and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. And then they all were encouraged and ate some food themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Paul stayed calm when everyone else was freaking out. And, and, and I can relate with that. I mean, have you ever been in a place of such anxiety, such depression, such stress that you can't eat? And then somebody comes along, like eating a burger. And you like envy them for that moment. Like, what is wrong with me, right? <laughs> Hopelessness is contagious, isn't it? Fear is just so contagious and they're all there on this boat that's getting tossed which that alone would make me not hungry fearing for their lives not eating for two weeks and Paul's just like anybody hungry? you know <laughs> everybody else is shaking they're terrified sits down puts his napkin around his neck <sighs> what? remarkable you know it, it, it's almost like it's almost like Paul's eyes weren't even fixed on the storm he was very he was very familiar with the Old Testament so I would assume he was very familiar with Isaiah 26 3 that says you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you interestingly enough we also see that between one and two years after this shipwreck event, Paul writes a letter to the church in Philippi. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. He says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, if I can confess to you the amount of times that I have read that and been like, come on, Paul. Come on. Maybe Paul was able to pen that because of what happened in Acts 27. Maybe Paul was speaking from experience. Maybe Paul was saying, hey, guys, I, ask Luke. He'll tell you, I've been in a storm. I've been in a terrible, terrible storm. And I ate good. I had peace. So morning comes, and they see a bay with a beach. They cut off the anchors, and they drift in until they get stuck on this sandbar. And the ship was dug into the sand, but the surf was destroying the rear or the stern of the ship. So it's time to get off quickly before the whole thing falls apart. Now at this point, what was supposed to happen, what typically would happen in this situation, is the soldiers kill all the prisoners. Because if one prisoner is able to swim away and escape, the soldiers lose their lives. So this plot was already in the soldiers' minds, we need to kill the prisoners before getting off of the ship, even though it's falling apart. But the centurion, who 
any other day, in any other situation, and be like, yep, let's do that. Let's keep ourselves alive. Said no. Because of Paul. I'll tell you what, if you were a prisoner who wasn't Paul on that ship, that was your lucky day. You should kiss Paul's feet. What a remarkable showing of how Julius felt about the Apostle Paul. So he commands them not to execute the prisoners for Paul's sake, and he tells the swimmers, you guys go ahead, swim to the beach. And then he tells the non-swimmers, you go ahead and pull a rose from Titanic and don't let Jack on there, even though he could, conf- he could fit. I know, it's crazy. And then float on broken pieces of the ship, get to shore, and we're going to be okay. And that's how the passage ends. I mean, this passage is one of the, if not the, most suspenseful and action-packed scenes from the Bible from a literary perspective. And the truth is, there are so many messages in this little passage of Scripture. So let me strongly encourage you this week, reread through it and make it your own. Whether it's lessons about storms or, or, or lessons um, about humanity and how, and how Luke was scared and in the end he was still okay. Or, there's so many places you can go and I want to encourage you to do that. Spend some time reading through this passage. But at, at the risk of chasing a rabbit hole, <laughs> um, I'd like to focus on one particular person in this story. And that person is the Apostle Paul. Now, when you first hear that, that might not really shock you because we've been focusing on him for quite a while. Um, But in this chapter of Acts, Paul really isn't the whole picture like he's been in many of the other passages. Uh, He gets a few cameos. But what we see here is Paul was able to lead from the stern. And that's today's message. It's leading from the stern. Leading when you're, when you're not the guy in charge. Leading when you don't have a title. And let me, let me first say, just because I just used the L word, it doesn't mean that any of you get to check out if you are not a company owner or a father or a manager or whatever. You, you don't get to check out there because ultimately God has called every one of us to be leaders. Every one of us. He calls us salt and he calls us light. And leadership is about serving and it's about influence. Serving and influencing. Leadership is not telling people what to do. Leadership is serving people and influencing them. And every single one of us are leaders. So let's look at a few qualities that we see in the midst of this storm that Paul took out to show what leaders look like. First, leaders have integrity. It was Paul's integrity that earned Julius' trust. And Pastor Tony has said frequently that integrity and Christian need to be synonymous. Integrity and Christian need to be synonymous. Listen, Roman centurions, this guy Julius, who was an elite Roman centurion on, on, on Caesar's personal guard to do prisoner transport, But all the centurions, they were often moral men and excellent judges of character. In fact, many historians have said if Rome was governed by its centurions rather than its politicians, it may have still been standing today. Paul's integrity was noticed by Julius and therefore Julius trusted him. He trusted him with his very life. As leaders, we are called to have integrity that transcends our circumstances. Let me just tell you something really boldly. Storms do not create integrity. They reveal it. Storms in our lives, the storms, they do not create integrity. They reveal it. I mean, Jesus gives a perfect example of this in Matthew 7. He says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. 
And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. The homes could have been identical. Both homes could have been gorgeous. In fact, the one built on the sand might have even been better looking and bigger. And before the storm came, they looked the same. But when the storm came, it revealed the integrity of the structure. It revealed what it was really resting on. Guys, what are we building our foundation on? Is our integrity founded in the word of God? Let me tell you, even, even, even a rock foundation that we put some sand <laughs> and then build a house, going to shift right off that sand. What are we founded on? Do you have integrity? Do people know beyond the shadow of a doubt you will always do what you say you will do? I mean, the word comes from the idea of wholeness. Of wholeness. Listen, who are we if we say God is sovereign and live like he's not? How can we say God is everywhere, God is omnipresent, God, God is the judge, and then, and then we sin knowingly, willingly, knowing that it's breaking his heart and that he sees it and knows it. Do we have integrity? Are we whole? Does the way we live match what we say? Match who we represent? Again, from the outside, we may look the same as everybody else. But when the storms come, they reveal who we really are. My question is, what are people willing to stake on your integrity? Julius was willing to stake his life on Paul's. Secondly, leaders take initiative. Paul spoke up long before the storm happened. When they were still docked in fair havens, Paul advised the decision makers that he didn't think sailing at this point was a good idea. But how do you get in there? Right? I mean, in, in, in the decision room, how on earth did Paul get in there? I mean, here, here was the chain of command on this ship, okay? So you've got the centurion. Under the centurion, you have soldiers. Under the soldiers, you have the ship's owner. Under the ship's owner, you have the ship's captain. Under the ship's captain, you have a bunch of sailors. Under the sailors, you have a bunch of paying passengers that are cruising along. And under them, you have prisoners. And somehow, Paul the prisoner is in the council room with these guys. Can I just say, we don't get to take initiative until we have integrity. Paul's integrity was, is what got him in that room. You want to take the initiative? Be men and women of integrity. And then let's take the initiative. Let's lead from the stern. You could be the lowest person on the totem pole. And you can lead. Because you lead yourself well. Because you follow Christ well. Have integrity in your life. And you will earn permission to speak up. And take the initiative. Paul was not disrespectful. Paul was not out of line. He respectfully said what he felt was important for the people above him to hear. And he said it respectfully and in private. And his input was only welcome because his integrity was known and he earned the right to speak. But let me just say, just because you are not in charge is not a good enough reason to not take responsibility. I am not saying to be divisive. That is wrong. A leader who takes initiative but does not have integrity is divisive. We must have integrity as we take initiative. And then we submit to the decisions. Paul submitted to the decisions that the leaders made without causing an uproar.
God has designed you and called you to lead in whatever situation that he has sovereignly placed you in. How do I know that? Because leading is about serving and it's about influence and we need to serve and influence others wherever we go. What does that mean? It means moms and dads serve and influence your kids. Yes, a part of leadership is telling people what to do. That's true. But more importantly, it is about serving and influencing with our integrity as we take initiative. And can I just tell you, the absence of the father in the home today is embarrassing. There's many fathers who are physically there but are absent. And can I just share a little bit of why, in my opinion? A man who feels that he lacks integrity is a man who feels like a hypocrite when he corrects his kids for something he himself is terrible at. Too bad. Here's a hypocrite preaching in front of you. Throw some stones, come on. Dads, we have to do better. We have to restore our integrity and take initiative in the home. Our families need us. They need us. Husbands and wives, you need to serve and influence your spouse. Children, you need to serve and influence your parents and your siblings. Friends, you need to serve and influence your friends. Christians, you need to serve and influence your enemies. By doing so, we influence others for Jesus Christ instead of complaining about what the authority that God has placed over us is doing. Let us serve with integrity and with excellence, but let us take initiative and take responsibility. Thirdly, leaders hold people accountable. You ever find yourself picking up the broken pieces of something that that somebody else broke after you warned them not to? Yeah, and, and all the parents of toddlers said amen, right? <laughs> okay. So did Paul. So did Paul. Paul found himself there. We see in verse 21, Paul sees the chaos, and then he, he takes the initiative to speak up. What does he open up with? I told you so! <laughs> Really, Paul? <laughs> Listen, you can't say I didn't say anything. I told you so. Was Paul being childish? <laughs> Not at all. Paul was holding people accountable. See, they took a vote, and the majority said yes. So he addressed everybody and said, hey, those of you that said yes, I told you so. Leaders hold others accountable. Paul didn't blast them to the point of frustration in the midst of a storm, but he held them accountable and he turned it into a teachable moment. And what's cool is he immediately encouraged them. He immediately encouraged them. He said, nobody's going to lose their life. It was a mistake, but, but God is good. The God who I worship has granted you all to live. God holds us accountable. Even after we're saved, God holds us accountable. He doesn't ignore our sin. He did something about it, and he does something about it. He's working on us slowly but surely and changing us. When we hold others accountable, we help them grow. I mean, too often we ignore the issues or, or, or we allow people to defer the blame elsewhere in order to not make somebody feel judged. But this helps no one. A, a great question that you should ask somebody when they're looking to, to blame somebody else or defer is, hey, how much of this can you own? How much of this is your fault? How much of this is your responsibility? See, because a person who continually passes the blame onto somebody else or onto the economy or onto our childhood issues is somebody who will continue to make the same mistakes over and over and over again. Listen, nobody, 
Nobody, I repeat, nobody has ever been changed for the better by making excuses. Zero percent of people have been changed for the better by making excuses. Now this doesn't mean we get to chastise people. Paul immediately went from accountability to encouragement. Accountability to encouragement. We all make mistakes. Newsflash, we're going to all continue to make mistakes. Paul did not avoid the fact that they did something foolish and against his counsel, but he recognized we're in the same boat. I wonder if that's where that metaphor comes from, huh? <clears throat> and so he encouraged everybody with God's truth and with grace. And lastly, leaders inspire. Leaders inspire. Paul inspired the others on the ship. He was cool and calm during the storm. And he invited them to eat with him when they were so anxious that they couldn't even look at food. Seeing Paul's faith in God and his calmness through the storm encouraged them and so they all sat down and they ate. We see the influence that, that Paul had was incredible. But the most remarkable thing of all was that the prisoners who would have been killed were all spared because of Paul's influence on Julius. Because of how Paul influenced a man who did not even call himself a believer in Jesus Christ. Who are you inspiring today? Who are you inspiring today? You see, you, you are in a world surrounded by people in, in your neighborhood and in, at your jobs and even in your families, surrounded by people who will never step foot in this building. Your life in the midst of a storm is the only sermon many of the people you encounter every day will ever hear. Let that resonate for a moment. That's incredible. You're all pastors. You're all missionaries. We're called to lead, whether we're in the captain's chair or we're in the stern of the ship. And God has called you to lead by serving and influencing the people around you that he has purposefully and sovereignly placed in your life. You don't need a title to lead. You don't. And one of the first things that I say to our youth leaders when they become youth leaders, we, we go through all different qualities of a leader. And one of the first ones that we go over is leaders are leaders before they're called leaders. Leaders are leaders long before they're called leaders. Some of you have no title. Some of you are single people who are not in charge of anything. And you're thinking, how on earth am I, am I supposed to lead? First of all, you lead yourself. Second of all, leading is about serving and influencing. And you interact with people, right? Ultimately, we need to lead with integrity. Once we have integrity, then we need to take initiative and responsibility. And then we need to hold ourselves and others accountable. And finally, we recognize that as others are inspired by us, we point them to the ultimate inspiration, and that is Jesus Christ. He is the only reason we have changed. So let us be a church that inspires this entire community to follow Jesus Christ. Let us be salt. Let us be light. Let us be the, the people that God has called us to be. Because when the storms hit, there will be an audience that is looking to you for leadership. And I don't know about you, but whenever I read the headlines, it looks a lot to me like the storms are hitting. There's a world in chaos right now and fear. And that's 
that's just on the breaking news level. In the midst of that, there's people losing their homes. There's people losing their families. There's people going through divorce. There's people that are fighting cancer. There's people that are fighting all other types of diseases that are, that are dealing with all these other issues in addition to the overarching headlines. People are in the midst of storm after storm after storm. They need inspiration. Ultimately, they need Jesus Christ. Let us lead them to him. Let us lead them to the cross. Let us lead him to the one place where they are safe from every storm for eternity. Amen? Amen. God, you are good. God, you are the perfect servant, the ultimate servant. Lord, you influence and serve the whole world by putting yourself on a cross. Father, give us the integrity. Father, work in our hearts and our lives. Lord, conform us to be more and more like Jesus each and every day. And and encourage us and strengthen us to take the initiative to be proactive in people's lives, Father, to see ourselves not as innocent bystanders or even as prisoners or victims, but let us get past the excuses, let us get past our fears and insecurities, and let us see ourselves as leaders who you put here to change the world. Lord, empower us and give us the faith to move forward even when it leads to shipwrecks. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Luke's honesty about his humanity, and I thank you for the faith that you encouraged him with using his friend Paul. Father, give us good godly friends that are on the same mission to encourage us, to stand by with us, to walk through storms with us. Let us create bonds that last eternity, God. And ultimately, let us point every person to the cross of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you, we praise you, we worship you, and we are head over heels in love with you. Thank you for leading us well. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.